what, what we're basically going to be doing today is um, instead of covering, obviously we've only got a single period, so it would be impossible to cover all of chapter five or all of chapter six or chapter seven in a single period. So what I decided to do is we're going to postpone the kind of full chapter recaps for those to some other time, not right now. What I wanted to do is um, I was looking through your Google, um, that quiz response thing that you did, um, the multiple choice quiz you did the other day. And I don't know if you guys remember, but in the last question I asked you to um, type any kind of topics that you were still finding a bit difficult from chapter, from unit three, um, or that you wanted me to recover again. And so some of the responses that um, some of you mentioned um, were these topics that I've put up on this slide here. So um, classical conditioning was one, organization of long-term memory was one, implicit explicit memory. Um, a few of you mentioned areas of the brain involved in long-term memory storage, hallmark features of Alzheimer's disease, uh, Loftus's studies, as well as the concept of those leading questions. So these were the main topics that you guys had uh, mentioned. So we're gonna just use this single period today um, to just go through these specific topics. And if you still get topics coming up later on that you get confused about, you can always ask me and we can maybe um, cover those in an offline session or at some other time, okay? Um, so I just wanted to do this so that, yeah, all those doubts would be clarified then by today for these topics. Okay, so um, the first topic that a lot of you were kind of confused about was um, classical conditioning. And I know classical conditioning isn't an easy topic. Remember, classical conditioning is just a form of associative learning where you're repeatedly associating two different kind of things or two different events. We call them stimuli. So in Pavlov's original study, what he did was he repeatedly um, presented food to the dog and then he repeatedly rung the bell at the same time or just before he presented the food. Okay, so maybe half a second before he um, presented the food, he would ring a bell. And so over time, the dog began to associate the ringing of the bell with the presentation of the food. And eventually what that led to was that Pavlov's dog was then able to salivate simply upon hearing the bell, even if the food wasn't presented, okay? Because its brain has started to associate the ringing of the bell with the uh, presentation of the food. Okay, so that's basically like a really simple summary of what his study was about. And you might have remembered that we did go through these um, five different elements, and it's very important for us to know what these elements are. Now, the first one was the unconditioned stimulus, which is basically the unconditioned thing or the unlearned thing. That's the thing that the dog doesn't have to learn to produce a naturally occurring response towards. So the dog doesn't have to learn to salivate towards food. It's a naturally occurring response. If someone throws dust in your eye, you don't have to learn to blink. You just naturally blink. Um, you know, we're all fasting. So like now when we're fasting, if someone puts really nice smelling food next to our nose, or next to our mouth, we are going to naturally salivate. Not in the same way a dog would salivate, but our salivary glands are going to get activated. We don't have to learn to do that. That is a naturally occurring bodily response. So anything or any kind of event or stimuli that naturally produces some kind of natural response without having to learn that response artificially is what we call as an unconditioned stimulus. Okay, it's a thing, unlearned thing, in other words. Um, the unconditioned response is connected to the unconditioned stimulus. So the unconditioned response is that particular response that we were talking about. So when you blink, when someone throws dust in your eye, that blinking due to the dust being thrown in your eye is the unconditioned response. An unconditioned response is unlearned. Remember, conditioned means learned. So unconditioned means unlearned. You don't have to learn that response because it happens automatically or reflexively. Your body just knows what it has to do. So every time the UCS or the unconditioned stimulus is presented, the organism will show the unconditioned response. So in Pavlov's dogs, the unconditioned response was obviously the salivation due to the presentation of the food. The neutral stimulus, um, as we obviously learned, is um, basically any stimulus that doesn't naturally or usually produce some kind of a response. So um, a bell shouldn't normally cause a dog to salivate. Okay, if I try to condition you to um, blink upon hearing a beep sound, that's not natural. No one should naturally blink when they hear a beep sound, okay? So that's why that beep sound would be an example of a neutral stimulus. So in the dog's case, the bell would be an example of a neutral stimulus because in normal circumstances in everyday life, that thing shouldn't normally cause a response in the organism or the living thing. 
Okay, so that's the neutral stimulus. And we said that the neutral stimulus always ends up becoming the condition stimulus. Okay, whenever you're identifying this in a scenario, when we were doing those scenarios together on the board as a class, remember we said the neutral stimulus and the condition stimulus are exactly the same. It's the same answer. Okay, you should not ever be losing marks for naming the neutral or condition stimulus because they're exactly identical in terms of the answer in a scenario. Okay, how they're not identical is that the condition stimulus becomes um, the condition stimulus because um, it has gone through that pairing or that association, okay? So in order for the neutral stimulus to become the condition stimulus, it has to be constantly paired with an unconditioned stimulus like food. So the bell itself will never cause an effect in the dog unless the bell is constantly paired with the food. So Pavlov rings the bell, shows the food, rings the bell, shows the food. That repeated pairing is what allows the neutral stimulus to become the condition stimulus. And the condition stimulus is obviously going to produce a learned response, which is called the conditioned response. And the conditioned response is basically a learned response because it doesn't happen naturally. It has to be artificially or kind of like um, uh, trained in the organism with learning principles. So obviously um, the conditioned response is the same response, but the reason that response is occurring is different now. So it's still salivation, but now the salivation is due to the bell. If we were talking about trying to train someone to blink upon hearing a beep noise, um, the conditioned response in that case would then be blinking due to the beep noise, okay? No longer beeping due to the uh, dust being thrown in eye. That was the unconditioned response. The conditioned response would then be blinking due to the hearing the beep noise, okay? Because that's something you've got to train a person to be able to demonstrate or show. Okay, so that's basically our five principles. I know these are confusing and we haven't done them in a while, so they might be even more confusing um, now. But are there any questions about these um, five principles here or like differentiating between them? Miss, they're called the elements, right? Yes, they're called the elements of um, classical conditioning. Sometimes in some VECA questions, they might refer to them as the language of classical conditioning. Yep. So these five yep, elements. So, and then you mentioned the five of them. Exactly, yeah. Sometimes it depends. If the question asks you to only mention like the specific ones, like only specifically unconditioned and neutral, then you don't even have to talk about all of them. Yeah. All righty. So that's basically um, our five principles of, uh, sorry, five elements of classical conditioning. Okay. So you should be able to know what these are. You don't need to know a definition of them word to word it's more important that you're able to identify these in like a scenario. So we're gonna look at a practice question for this um, soon. So obviously, um, if you know the elements of classical conditioning, you should be able to understand how the three phase uh, conditioning process works. Three phase means that there are three phases. The first phase is before conditioning, the second phase is during conditioning, and the third phase is after conditioning. So if we apply this to Pavlov's dog experiment, um, in the first phase, the neutral stimulus, which was the bell, obviously produced no response. This was before the conditioning process took place. And the unconditioned stimulus, which was the food, produced an unconditioned response, which was the salivation due to the food. Okay, that was before any learning happened, way before any learning or any conditioning process was attempted by Pavlov. Now, when Pavlov starts to um, begin this kind of conditioning process, this is when we move into phase two, which is the during conditioning process. In the during conditioning process, the neutral stimulus, which is the bell, and the unconditioned stimulus, which is the food, are repeatedly paired and associated with each other. What that means or what that would look like in real life is Pavlov going up to the dog, ringing the bell, putting the food in front of the dog's face, ringing the bell, putting the food in front of the dog, ringing the bell, putting the food in front of the dog. And he would do this repeatedly because there has to be a repeated pairing of the neutral stimulus bell with the unconditioned stimulus food. And the dog needs to be able to form that association in its brain that, hey, every time Pavlov rings the bell, almost immediately he shows me the food. So there has to be some relationship between these two events. Now, by the end of the during conditioning stage, after that repeated pairing occurs, at some point in the dog's brain, the dog is going to no longer see the bell as a neutral stimulus because the bell has actually now become a conditioned stimulus. Pavlov has associated um, the dog getting the food now with the bell. So the bell is no longer neutral because now the bell will actually produce a response in the dog. And that's when we come to the third phase, which is after conditioning, that now the neutral stimulus has actually become the conditioned stimulus and that the conditioned stimulus, which is obviously the bell, now produces a conditioned response 
The response at its heart is still salivation, but the reason that response occurs is different. So the bell now produces a conditioned response, which is salivation due to the bell, not salivation due to the food, okay? Because salivation due to the food was the initial unconditioned response. So as long as you understand what I've written here in red um, and black, like the first main things here, this is kind of what you really need to be able to know if you're gonna ever answer a question about the three phase conditioning uh, process, okay? And obviously you need to be able to know this, not just for Pavlov's study, but if you get another scenario, you should be able to apply this understanding or apply this knowledge to that particular new scenario as well. So are there any questions about like this three phase? It's basically everything we just covered on the previous slide about the elements, but we're just putting it into a structure of this is what happens first, this is what happens second, this is what happens third. Yeah, everyone's all good. Okay, cool. Um, I think we can probably do a practice question. Honestly, I can't even remember if we did this in class or not anymore. Um, but even if we did, we probably all forgot it by now. So let's just um, work on this practice question now. It's worth five marks. And you might understand why it's worth five marks because there are five elements in classical conditioning and using the terminology of classical conditioning means that we have to be naming those elements or explaining or using those elements. So I'm gonna give you guys about um, five minutes now to work on this question. And if you have any confusions while you're, doing, while you're working on this, just um, speak up or uh, put, put it in the chat box. So five minutes on the clock starting from now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, was his study uh, um, approved? Uh, sorry, say that again. Was his study like approved? Which one? The one that we just did. Uh, I did not get what you said. Sorry, say it again. Um, you know how he did an experiment like on the dog? Oh, you mean his study? Yeah. yeah um, you know, the thing is, um, Nora, back in those days, like he conducted his study back in the 18, 18, 18 something, like 1800s. So um, back then they didn't have ethical um, committees to actually approve studies. Yes, they did. Yeah. So a lot of the time, um, even studies like uh, you know, the little Albert experiment, those studies, they didn't actually have to get like strict approvals back then. Um, because they didn't have ethics committees that were established at that point in time. So, mm -hmm. got away with a lot of bad kinds of experiments. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you've got about two minutes left.
Okay, I'm just going to start reading the scenarios. So Katrina eats toast for breakfast every day. Three days in a row, the toast got stuck in the toaster and burned, setting off the smoke alarm. The smoke alarm made a high-pitched noise that caused a dog Buster to startle and then run away. Now, whenever Katrina uses the toaster, Buster runs outside and hides in the garden. Using the terminology of classical conditioning, explain how Buster has come to fear the toaster. So what we're doing here is we are going to be naming our five um, elements of classical conditioning, so our unconditioned stimulus, all that stuff. We're going to try to link it to Katrina's um, scenario here with Buster. So I'll just show you guys a sample answer for that. Now, you don't have to do the before conditioning, um, after conditioning, all this stuff. I've just put this in here because I wanted you guys to, again, see an example of how you could incorporate the previous slide we did into a question like this. So what we're really concerned about and what would be getting us the five marks for this question, are uh, um, you basically stating what is the neutral stimulus, what is the unconditioned stimulus, et cetera. So um, the first thing we're looking at is what is the neutral stimulus? So if you think about it, what's the, what's the thing in this scenario that wouldn't normally cause Buster to run away and hide in the garden? Well, if you look at the actual scenario here, it says that three days in a row, the toast got stuck in the toaster and burnt, setting off the smoke alarm. And then at the end of the scenario, it says now whenever Katrina uses the toaster. So the toaster is kind of the thing that has gone from, be, from being a neutral stimulus to a conditioned stimulus. Okay, so at the beginning um, of this scenario, the toaster was a neutral stimulus. And so that would be a neutral stimulus because a toaster shouldn't naturally or normally cause a dog to run away and hide in the garden or run away and hide somewhere. Okay, so that's basically what um, the neutral stimulus is. What's the unconditioned stimulus then? So what's the stimulus or what's the thing that's actually causing a natural response? If we look for the natural response in Buster here or what kind of behavior he showed, the natural response is Buster um, getting startled, so getting a bit scared and then running away. Um, and we have to look at, okay, what caused him to get startled and run away? So what caused him to get startled and run away would be our unconditioned stimulus. In this case, it's the smoke alarm, which made a high pitch noise. So for this reason, our unconditioned stimulus, the thing that would naturally cause any person to get scared or any animal to get scared and run away would be the smoke alarm and it's high pitch noise. Not the smoke alarm just by itself. You have to mention in your answer, the smoke alarm making the high pitched noise. Okay, that's the unconditioned stimulus. And obviously the unconditioned response is then uh, Buster getting startled and running away due to the high pitched smoke alarm. So you have to mention the due to, um, that's important. You can't just say getting startled and running away full stop. You have to mention what was that response due to, or what, what was the thing that caused that response to occur. Okay, so that's our neutral stimulus, unconditioned stimulus and unconditioned response identified. And basically now all we really um, have left to identify is our conditioned stimulus and our conditioned response. So our conditioned stimulus is obviously identical to the neutral stimulus. So you should have wrote, uh, written um, the toaster. Um, and the conditioned response is obviously what response comes um, or what response do we see in Buster when Katrina uses the toaster? So obviously Buster running away, getting startled or getting frightened, running away into the garden, and um, that is the conditioned response, and that now occurs due to Katrina using the toaster, which is the conditioned stimulus. Okay, um, does this question make sense to everyone, or did everyone kind of get similar answers or any confusions about why one of the elements was this and not that or anything like that? Yeah. All clear? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so we'll just um, move on. Okay, I've already like literally shown you guys this slide like millions of times and always talked about this, that when you write the unconditioned response and the conditioned response, you have to write the due to part. Still every year, a lot of students lose marks on VCA exams related to this just because um, they don't write the due to or they don't write um, what the response was actually a result of or the factor that actually influenced the response. So remember, even if you write salivation and you don't write the due to part, you are going to get zero marks for that, even if your response is technically correct, because you're not writing how that response was caused or what that response was pr uh, produced by um, that VCAR assessor or the examiner will not be able to give you the full mark. So do not forget the due to. That's why I always underline it. I always put it in a different color in the slide because you have to do it. Okay, you have to write due to or you won't get the marks. And that's only for the responses. So only for the elements that end in R, U, C, R, and C, R, you have to do the due to part. Okay, 
the next topic that um, some of you were finding a little bit difficult was the organization of long term memory, as well as the explicit and implicit memory. So when we're talking about the organization of long term memory, um, what we're really kind of focused on is the fact that long term memory is a vast store of memory. It's got an unlimited capacity. And we can't just chuck every single bit of information we have about everything we know into long term memory and just expect to be able to easily uh, take it out. So obviously long term memory does have a structure, it does have an organization where specific memories like episodic memories are held in specific parts of the brain. Okay, and procedural memories are held in another part of the brain. And how the long term memory is organized actually also reflects this concept of explicit versus implicit memory. Explicit memory is basically memory that you can easily talk about, okay? That's why we've got these people, um, this image of two people talking here. So explicit memory is memory that you can easily talk about. It's also called declarative memory. The word declarative um, is related to the word declare. When someone declares something, they're able to verbally say it. They're able to, verb uh, they're able to verbalize it or articulate it. So, um, explicit memory is basically memory with awareness. It's memories that you can talk about consciously and they're easy to talk about, they're easy to write about. Um, so that's basically what explicit memory is, okay? Implicit memory, on the other hand, is memory without awareness. These are memories that will often form without you even explicitly, um, explicitly kind of recognizing or understanding that, hey, this memory is being formed. So when you're riding a bike, it's not like you're telling yourself, hey, my memory of how to, uh, you know, how to pedal the bike or how to balance the bike is now being stored in my long-term memory. That's not, that's not happening, okay? That doesn't happen in the same way that a semantic memory would be formed, where you are reading through re revision notes, trying to memorize the definition. Procedural memories are implicit because a lot of the time, they occur or they get stored into your memory without you even consciously sometimes being aware of that particular thing happening. Okay, you might be riding a bike, but you don't know how well that memory is being stored. Okay, but the more you ride your bike, the better that memory does eventually get stored. Another example is classically conditioned memory. So when Pavlov's dogs were getting uh, classically conditioned to salivate upon hearing a bell, um, they weren't, you know, consciously or explicitly like telling themselves that, hey, you know, I'm being conditioned by Pavlov, I have to remember this memory. Or when little Albert was being conditioned by John Watson to uh, cry upon seeing a white rat, he wasn't like consciously thinking about how that was being stored in his memory, but it was still um, a memory that was getting consolidated without his awareness. Okay, so implicit memories are memories that occur without awareness and what that means is that you are also going to find it a lot more difficult to discuss or to talk about or to verbalize or describe these memories. Um, so for example, if you ask a little girl, can you write me a 200 word essay about write, how to ride a bike? That girl will probably be a little bit more confused. She might just, she might just tell you, oh, you know what, that's a bit hard, but let me um, come outside and I'll show you how to do it. Um, because it's a lot easier for us to demonstrate what procedural memories look like rather than it is to talk about them. And one of the reasons for that, as we're going to learn in a, in a few slides, is that the procedural memories are often processed in the cerebellum, which is all to do with movement. So it's easier for us to act out a procedural memory or show somebody a procedural memory rather than it is to write an essay about what, how to do it or how to... Um, you know, how to perform that procedural memory, okay? And you there's skill set. Sorry? There's skill set for that. Yes, exactly, because it's representing a skill set, which often involves like murder movements as well. If you ever watch, like if, you ever, if you've ever learned how to do something by watching a YouTube tutorial as well, you would realize that it's a lot easier for you to watch a YouTube um, tutorial. Like the other day when I was making something, um, I, I like Googled a recipe um, online and I was reading through it, but then I was like, you know what, it's probably easier for me to watch somebody, somebody doing it. Um, so when you watch someone doing it, you actually learn a little bit better because you're able to better see the motor movements that they're making in order to, I don't know, fold a samosa or bake a cake or something like that. Okay, so that's basically um, what procedural memory is about. Okay, and they're implicit because they're a lot harder to describe in words. Um, whereas explicit memories are a lot easier to describe in words. If I ask you, okay, uh, what was your grade six graduation like? You should be able to describe that to me in words. You would be able to write an essay about it. If I tell you to give me the definition of glutamate, you should be able to do that because those are um, memories that are easier to 
uh, describe in words. And when you were going through these memories, these were memories that were a lot more vivid and they were a lot more easier for you to um, be in the moment of. So when you were in your grade six graduation, you were in the moment and all that information was very, very vivid and very easier for you to later on talk about with someone. Okay, so that's the organization of the long-term memory and a kind of like brief uh, explanation of explicit and the difference between explicit and implicit memory. Okay, um, now we're going into um, a topic that a few of you were cons uh, confused about, which was the brain regions involved in the storage of long-term memories. So when we're looking at storage of long-term memories, um, we're basically looking at um, a few main brain areas. The first one is the cerebral cortex. So the cerebral cortex is obviously to do with your brain lobes. So what you really need to take away from this slide is that the frontal lobe has a very big role after the hippocampus in explicit memory storage, okay? All of your explicit memories like episodic and semantic memories, they're mainly held in your hippocampus, but they're also stored in your frontal lobe as well. So if you ever get a question that says, uh, which areas of the brain are most involved in um, storing um, explicit memories? you would say firstly the hippocampus and secondly the frontal lobe of the uh, frontal lobe of the brain okay which is obviously a part of your cerebral cortex um, when we're talking about the specific aspects or components of a memory so if i ask you okay um, on your grade 6 graduation what were um, what area or what um, region of the brain was involved in storing um, you know the sites of your parents' faces or how proud they were when you were up on stage or whatever. Um, and because that's a sight, because that's a visual related image in your memory, you would then, you should then be able to say that the occipital lobe was responsible for storing the sights relevant to that memory. Okay. If I was to ask you, okay, what music was playing, um, you know, um, let me think of an example. What music was playing on your 18th birthday party or something like that? Or what was the last song that played before the party ended? You should be able to kind of um, remember that because the sounds of that memory should be stored in your temporal lobe, which contains our primary auditory cortex. Okay, that's all you really need to know about the cerebral cortex and its role in memory. The explicit memories are mainly stored in the frontal lobe, which means all your episodic and semantic memories. Um, have some storage in the frontal lobe along with the hippocampus and that any sights and sounds related to a memory are either stored in your occipital lobe if it's a visual image or in your temporal lobe if it's a sound or auditory related stimuli. Okay, so that's basically all you really need to know about how the cerebral cortex is involved in our storage of long-term memories. Then we look at the hippocampus. So the hippocampus, obviously, just to kind of summarize what's on this slide, the hippocampus obviously is the main area in which episodic and semantic memories are consolidated. Hippocampus has a very, very big role in consolidation. And um, if you look at this diagram here, it's just a diagram of a hippo um, who owns a campus, hippocampus, and he's wearing like a hat. So just remember the hippo wearing the university hat to remember that it's not just episodic memories um, that are held in your hippocampus, but also semantic memories, memories related to academic related knowledge and um, facts and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so obviously um, the hippocampus has everything to do with explicit memory. Explicit memory means episodic and semantic. In addition to this, and there was a question on this in the quiz, um, your hippocampus also has a role in spatial memory. And a lot of research has been conducted to prove this that has found that London cab drivers have large hippocampal areas compared to the rest of the normal population. So the hippocampus plays a big role in consolidation of information, number one, especially consolidation of explicit memories. It plays a role in long-term potentiation as well. And it plays a role in spatial memory, which is your uh, memory of uh, directions of how to get somewhere. Um, and that's why a lot of the time, if you ask like a taxi driver, can you write me down like, um, you know, can you write me down on this paper, the directions of how to get from this place to that place? They'll easily be able to do this, do that. They'll be like, oh yeah, give me a pen. I'm, I can help you with that. Because they've got a really good spatial memory, okay? Because obviously um, the main experiences they go through. Okay, um, so that's basically the hippocampus. The next thing that we're looking at is the amygdala. So the amygdala, um, the amygdala's main role in memory formation or long-term memory is storing your emotional 
components to your long-term memories. So if you've got an episodic memory, like let's say your 18th birthday party, that episodic memory itself will be stored um, within the hippocampus and frontal lobes. However, the emotions attached to that episodic memory, like um, for example, maybe you had a fight with your friend on your 18th birthday at the party and that made you super angry or that made you super anxious. Those emotions might be attached to the memory because of the amygdala. Okay, so the amygdala is involved with attaching emotional components like fear, aggression, frustration, any kind of intense emotion to our episodic or semantic memories. Um, and as we learned, the amygdala does have a role in the consolidation of emotionally rising experiences. It doesn't do the consolidation itself. The consolidation is done by the hippocampus, but the amygdala is the one that signals to the hippocampus. Remember, it's the one that signals to the hippocampus that, hey, this info has got to be consolidated. So without the amygdala, the hippocampus can't really do that consolidation as well. Okay. And like we looked at before, when we looked at the implicit types of memory, um, Classically, classically conditioned memories also fall under that. And we talked about the fact that um, when you remove someone's amygdala, they are actually not able to show a fear response anymore. Okay, so um, that's basically some research that's been done to show that the amygdala does have a role in fear response and it does have a role in aggression as well. So just remember A for amygdala, A for aggression, A for associative learning, which is classical conditioning. Okay, that's basically the amygdala. The main role of the amygdala in long-term memories is to attach emotional um, components or attach emotions like fear and aggression or anxiety to your episodic and semantic memories. And the last thing that we're looking at is the cerebellum. So the cerebellum is all to do with your motor movements and motor sequences. And for this reason, like I said before, the cerebellum is involved with procedural memory. Any procedural memory, if you think about it, most procedural memories involve movement, whether it's driving a car, whether it's baking a cake, whether it's um, you know um, playing tennis, whether it's playing a piano, whatever. All of those things require movements, okay? And the cerebellum is involved in procedural memory because all procedural memories of how to do things often always require movement, okay? Make the link between those two concepts. So because all procedural memories usually are, involve some kind of movement, the cerebellum is always involved with procedural memories. So obviously um, the uh, cerebellum, because it's involved with procedural memories, we say that it does have a larger role in implicit memory as a whole, okay? So obviously, um, any memory where you are doing any kind of skilled sequence of movements, like playing a piano, playing a musical instrument, all of that kind of stuff would also require the cerebellum um, as well. And another thing that is important to remember about the cerebellum is that it does have a role in spatial navigation. Now, this is different from spatial memory and the hippocampus. Spatial navigation is actually your physical ability to navigate your environment. So if you, ever take, if you ever look at someone that's walking outside and they're just walking around everywhere and they can't seem to know where to go, that could be because um, they don't really, that could be an issue with their spatial navigation, their ability to navigate the spatial or social environment in a physical way, okay? Not their ability to recall directions um, to get to a place and write it on a piece of paper, that's spatial memory. Okay, so the cerebellum has everything to do with procedural memories. And for that reason, it does have a role in our implicit memory. Okay, um, the last few things we're going to go through are the hallmark features of Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease, obviously, we know it's a neurodegenerative disease. When we talk about the hallmark features, we are basically talking about the three main things that we see in the brain of an Alzheimer's disease patient that sets them apart from a patient with a normal healthy brain. And those three things are number one, the formation of toxic amyloid plaques. Amyloid is a protein that um, is actually toxic to the brain. So amyloid should never be in a person's brain. It's not normal. Um, and you can see in this image here that these plaques actually form little clumps. Okay, a plaque is another word for like a clump or a lump of a substance um, that's kind of formed together or bound together. So these amyloid, this amyloid substance actually forms kind of big lumps or clumps in that person's brain which actually end up becoming plaques. So they kind of stick to parts of the brain and they eventually kill out all the neural connections or neural circuits within that area that they've affected. The other thing that, um, that we see in patients with Alzheimer's disease is the presence of neurofibrillary tangles, which actually tangle around 
tangle around neurons that are communicating with one another and actually disrupt communication. So whenever something is tangled, you know, you can't have good communication. If you think about your earphones, well, none of you have wired earphones these days. You've all got those AirPods or whatever. But um, back in the day when people used to use like the earphones with the wires, um, if they'd ever get tangled up, you'd realize that you can't really listen to your music properly. It's like it comes out a bit like, you know, not clear. And there's some kind of issue there or some kind of disruption. So obviously in the same way, neurofibrillary tangles actually disrupt neural communication by actually um, tangling around the neurons or around the neural um, connections that are trying to be made. And the last thing that, um, the last hallmark feature is reduced levels of acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is a um, neurotransmitter. It's really important for memory and learning similar to glutamate. Um, but it is found to be abnormally low in patients with Alzheimer's disease. So these are our three main hallmark features, okay? The formation of amyloid plaques, the formation of neurofibrillary tangles, and abnormally low levels of acetylcholine. So you've got to know these three um, hallmark features. Okay, and the last thing that we're really looking through today before we finish up is the Loftus and Palmer's study. Now, I think you guys were fine with the study, but there was, um, someone had mentioned that they didn't really understand this whole concept of leading questions. So I'll emphasize on the actual um, concept of the leading questions. Now, leading questions are basically questions that are set up or they're framed or they're structured in a way that they actually lead a person to respond in a specific desired way. So if a lawyer wants an eyewitness to actually confess or to make up some story that a red car was at the scene, they might ask the eyewitness approximately how fast did the car, red car speed away after he hit the pedestrian. And by asking them that question, you realize that that question actually plants this information that a red car was present in the scene. And by asking this question, the eyewitness starts to think, hey, if the lawyer is asking me about a red car being at the scene, um, then it should, should have been at the scene. And Maybe I just didn't see it, or maybe I just mistook it for another car. So essentially what leading questions do is that they actually plant false information into the person's um, head. And remember these per people don't always have to necessarily be eyewitnesses that are being questioned by lawyers. It could be anyone questioning them. It could be a, a media reporter. It could be um, a friend. It could be someone who's witnessed, um, who's witnessed the incident, okay? In your quiz, I think it was a librarian who was the one who was asking the um, leading question. Okay, so a leading question is any question that plans some kind of false information within the question, um, which actually causes the person to start to reconstruct or question their own memory of what they saw in the event. Um, yeah, we already know the study, so I'm not gonna really go into that. Um, the last thing I want you guys to do today is I want you guys to have a look at this question here and try to um, come up with a solution to this um, question now. So you've got about five minutes. I'll give you about four minutes to just jot down um, what you think would be some important things to mention in a question like this. Yeah, I don't want to go over time. So I think I'll just quickly read the scenario and just show you guys the um, 
kind of key words you'd have to talk about in an answer like this. So um, Harvey was waiting to cross the road when suddenly he saw a masked individual push a young woman to the ground, snatch her handbag and run away. Before he was interviewed by police, Harvey was immediately bombarded by the questions of eager television reporters who saw the incident as a great piece of evening news. The reporters asked many questions, including how old was the man who snatched the handbag? Um, and what did the man use to threaten the woman before he shoved her to the ground? When interviewed by the police two days later, Harvey described the masked individual as being a tough looking man who was six foot tall and that he possessed a knife. In, later court, in the later court case, Harvey's eyewitness testimony was questioned by the defense lawyers for the accused. In terms of Loftus's study on eyewitness testimony and fallibility of memory, justify why Harvey's testimony could potentially be unreliable. So obviously here, as soon as we see the questions here, they are leading questions because obviously they have set up Harvey to um, reconstruct his memory. And I'll tell you why. In the first sentence here, it says that Harvey saw a masked individual. It doesn't mention anything about the masked individual, yeah. the man. It doesn't mention anything about the masked individual having a knife in his hand or having a gun. Um, and it doesn't mention anything about how tall the man was or how tough looking the man was. It just says a masked individual. Okay. Um, but obviously, when the TV reporters come up to Harvey and ask him these leading questions like how old was the man, that's planting false information that the, guy, the masked individual who did this crime was a man. And when they ask him what did the man use to threaten the woman, it plants this false information that yes, the man did use some something to threaten the woman before he pushed her to the ground. So what these two leading questions are doing is that they're setting up Harvey to respond in a particular way and they're setting him up to actually reconstruct or go back and actually change his original memory of what he actually witnessed with his own eyes. Okay, so when he's asked by the police two days later, maybe he watched the evening news, maybe he heard what other people were saying, um, Harvey actually did eventually describe the masked individual as being a tough looking man because you've, you've, got, you've got to look tough if you're going to shove a woman to the ground being six foot tall, I don't know where that came from, and that he possessed a knife. Because remember the question said, what did the man use to threaten the woman? So he's actually added all these extra details into his memory, even though this is not necessarily what he saw. And in doing that, he's actually reconstructed his original memory of the um, event that he actually witnessed. Okay, so obviously some, I will just show you guys the answer. Um, the first thing you'd have to mention, or the first mark will be for talking about the fact that Harvey would have reconstructed his memory. Mentioning the word reconstructed there is a key word. The second mark will have come from him adding extra information, like adding the fact that, oh, the guy possessed a knife and he was a guy, he wasn't a girl who attacked the lady. Um, then your other two marks uh, come from your leading questions. So talking about the fact that number one, Harvey was asked leading questions by um, television reporters. And number two, um, the second thing you're doing there is you're basically um, explaining how did those um, leading questions then cause him to reconstruct his memory. So you could say that because um, Harvey, because Harvey, um, you know, because the leading question mentioned the word man, Harvey was set up to believe that it was a man that was involved. Or because the leading question mentioned the word uh, threaten, or what did the man use to threaten, uh, Harvey was set up to answer that the man was armed. Okay, when in actual fact, this might not be something that is, um, actually reliable. Okay, so that's basically um, what we are doing today. And um, yeah, that's about it for today. So if you've got any other questions, I'm happy to stay on for a few more minutes. But if you're, if you're all good, then yeah, that's basically it. I'd just like you guys to submit your um, unit three trial exam by Sunday night if you want me to mark it. Otherwise, you can just do it at your own pace and we will discuss um, answers to that next Wednesday, inshallah. Okay, so if you're all good, you can leave this Zoom right now and have a nice weekend. I'll see you guys next week, inshallah. Miss? Yes? Um, can, can you also talk about context-dependent cues in this? Yes, you definitely can. But in this specific question, it doesn't... If there was a part B to this question, for example, that said explain how the police could, um, could actually um, make Harvey's... Um, memory of the event a little bit more reliable, you could say then that, yeah, the police could um, use context dependent cues by taking um, Harvey back to the scene of the crime. And there might be certain things in the environment that jog his memory or that make him remember the actual event. 
And would his uh, memory be more accurate? Yes, if, if uh, the police were to use those context-dependent cues, his memory could become more accurate, correct? Yeah.